Hi. Um, you got a lot of questions about climate today. Yes. I to ask you, you know, you mentioned that you think the climate agenda or bad climate policies are harming more people than climate change itself. Killing more people even. Yes. Killing more people. Can you tell me a little bit about what some of those policies are and how you would kind of yeah. So I think it's the anti-carbon agenda that stops us from producing fossil fuels in the United States. It is the policies that stop us from fracking for natural gas in the United States. And that is contributing to higher energy costs. It's higher contributing to higher costs across the board. It's also contributing to a problem of energy, de energy deficiencies in parts of the world where people are dying from lack of access to abundant energy. So what I would do is get the regulations and the permitting process fixed in the Department of Interior get any of those cumbersome regulations out of the way. A lot of them are unconstitutional, including at the EPA today, to be able to take what God has endowed the United States with, a lot of oil and natural gas, get it out of the ground, sell it, make energy more plentifully abundant and available, and also, as a side note, embrace nuclear energy, which I do think it is a bit of a mystery that many of the climate alarmists are also the biggest opponents of nuclear energy. I think it calls out the ultimate hypocrisy that the climate agenda has nothing to do with the climate. It has to do with global equity, specifically letting China catch up. Once you see that for what it is, it's hard to unsee it. And that allows us to say that, you know what, the reason they're against nuclear energy is because it might be too good at solving the problem. Because then what's going to be the next excuse for China to be able to catch up to the U.S.? So once you see it that way, you realize that embracing American energy in all of its forms is actually the path forward to prosperity and American flourishing and human flourishing, not worshipping this capital C new cult of climate. And you said all forms, that so you would also you know, continue effort to yeah. win solar. Not with subsidies. I don't think the government should be subsidizing it, but if, if there are market-based approaches that prove that wind and solar can stand on their own two feet, I have no objection to that. All of the above is good, but I do not believe the government tilting the scales with picking favorites, as I think is they're doing with wind and solar today. Thank you. Yeah, I want to ask you about the Proud Boys sentencing really quickly, but first, um, Nikki Haley earlier this week said that Mitch McConnell should step down and call the Senate the saddest nursing home in the country. I'm paraphrasing her a little bit. I asked you yesterday about um, the situation. You said you didn't want to address it. Well, it was in real time. We didn't have all right. the facts. And since then, he's been given a clean bill of health and starting to return to the Senate. I wonder if he could give you another chance to address the situation. I think it'd be most prudent if he stepped aside. I think that'd be the, I think that'd be the most prudent decision for him to make. And I think that it is time for also to use that as a chance to put somebody in that seat who's going to stand for unapologetic America first principles, not reciting slogans memorized in 1980, but actually acknowledging what it means to be proud of this nation, standing on our own two feet as the United States, advancing our interests both at home and through our foreign policy. And so I would be more ambitious in not just saying it has to be someone of a different generation, that superficial identity politics if we just stop there. I think that we need somebody who also moves the GOP forward. And I do think that there's a certain irony where even some Republicans who might call for Mitch McConnell to step down are really doing nothing more than spouting off the slogans that the likes of Mitch McConnell are spouting off without thinking about it. And I think that we need to move beyond the neoconservative establishment to think of actually how we put America First principles into action. So I'm a little bit more ambitious when I think about how we're going to fill that seat. It's not just that someone vaguely of a different generation or of a different identity politic checking that box. No. I think this is a moment to actually move the party forward. And then just really quickly, there were two Proud Boys who were sentenced in Washington today, uh, both of them for over 10 years, one of them for 15 years. I just want to give you a chance to react to those sentences, uh, what you make of the prosecutions in general of Proud Boys and uh, people who are charged and convicted with crimes related to January 6th and the length of sentences that have been given. So anyone who is a peaceful January 6th protester who was not themselves violent will get a pardon from me on day one as part of a statement that we will restore one standard of the rule of law in this country. We have one standard for BLM and Antifa, a different one for peaceful protesters on January 6th. Anyone who is peaceful that day will earn a pardon. And anybody who had due process denials, including through Brady rule violations or otherwise, evidence, perhaps video footage that they didn't get to see, anyone who suffered a constitutional due process violation, and anybody who was a peaceful protester on the grounds that day will get a pardon on January 20th, 2025. So I have not seen evidence yet suggesting that these two individuals were themselves violent. And if that indeed holds true to be the case, then anyone who was a peaceful protester that day will get a pardon. That's my answer.
Okay. Um, two quick questions for you. One, you speak about uh, putting the military on the southern border. I believe we spoke about the northern border yesterday. Can you just yes. expand on plans for that? So it is a prediction of where I think we will see some of the problems of the southern border move to. And so I am prepared to use the military to seal not just the southern border, but the northern border too. But in my first three months in office, we will have sealed the southern border. And we will be prepared and have plenty of planning to do it to seal the northern border as necessary as well. And part of the reason I think it will be necessary is that much of what we see at the southern border is indeed intentional. I think this is the intentional product of China aiming to undermine the United States and, I'm sad to say, doing so successfully. And so they have no reason to, I have no reason to believe that just because we seal the southern border, that intention is going to stop. And that's why we're going to be prepared to then take action on the northern border as well. And one other quick question. It's September 1st. We're in the month of the second GOP debate. Are you going yes. to do anything different this month to prepare? No. Continue to talk to voters. I think it's the best form of debate prep. I mean, look at the questions I got tonight. These are, these are real questions, right, from people across the country. I think, frankly, many in the media, many in the political establishment would do well to listen to the voters who are actually asking, I think, some of the best questions I've gotten on the trail. And so that's going to be my best form of debate prep. Ten-year-old Grace is giving it to you. Ten-year-old? She was, she was good. Yeah, probably one of my best debate preppers was uh, was a ten year old girl today. So. She was AI in Portsmouth. She was what? She asked you about AI. She was the AI question in Portsmouth in that gym or what? In, in the big forum. Oh yeah, he was far right, the far right of the room. Oh, her dad. Oh, that okay. So he was a Trump supporter. We converted. I remember him. Oh, that's good. That's good. She's she's she was an impressive young woman. I have a question for you. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 We all sit here. So good. Okay. There's, good. There's yeah, all good. All right, you go ahead. All right. So the thing I'm most concerned about is when well, I pull out my silver certificate. Oh no, federal. Oh no, there's a silver certificate. This is what I'm worried about: the dollar. Mm-hmm. CBDC, central bank digital currency, BRICS. The Fed Now program. All of this stuff happening. I don't want anything happening with the South African RAND. I don't want the word RAND used to talk about the U.S. dollar unless it's by this soon-to-be senior senator from Kentucky. Mm, I like right? that. I like that. I love that guy. Yeah. So good. what are you going to do as president to protect the dollar as it comes to oil trade, as it comes to natural gas, as it comes to everything as the world currency? This is going to go. The silver certificate is gone. It says on here, $1.00 in silver, payable to the bearer on demand. Well, I think that we should actually restore the actual real value of the dollar. I favor pegging it to commodity value. We could debate which basket, gold, silver, nickel, but I think a basket of commodities pegging the dollar, effectively the logic behind going to the gold standard, that's something I embrace. I think that that actually ties the hand of the government in a way that's actually good at a moment when the dollar is otherwise at risk of losing its status as the reserve currency of the world, as you're seeing alternatives like the BRICS alliance potentially forming a currency that's backed by gold. Look at economic growth. GDP growth in this country was actually much better before we went off the gold standard pre-1971. And so I think that moving back to a gold or gold-like standard through a basket of commodities is the right direction to go. I know that bucks the establishment orthodoxy today. I think it's part of my pro-growth agenda. So we're on the same page. CBDCs. My short answer to that is absolutely not. Put the kibosh on it instantly, and I know I can do that in my first month in office. The Fed now program and anything related to the digitization of the dollar, forget about it. We will not create the vector for a social credit system in this country. If it lasts as long as the election. If yeah, I, I, think in this I think in this particular case it's going to take them a lot longer to get there than between now and January 2025. So in this case, I'm optimistic I'll be able to get and that shame done. shame on that not being a question at the debate. And double shame if Fox Business, if it was Maria and Larry Kudlow asking the questions, yeah. that would be one of the questions for that. Well, I think the reason I'm asking is I don't think the other candidates will know what it is, but I think I'm sure they'll get coached between now. I don't know what the heck CBDC is, but I know the right answer is no. And so that's just the way things work in the Republican Party. So if they do ask it, I don't even think it'll be that meaningful of a debate because people will just recite some slogans without understanding the depth of the problem. But I think the true, the true understanding of the weaponization of the financial market through our currency itself, right. something I've written books about, I understand this. The good news is I'm optimistic we'll be able to address it. So, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.